fun. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Uh, everybody can hear me? All right. Hello, everyone. This is Nelson for Games Matter. And today I'm here with... How would I pronounce your name? Oh, God. Kaylin. Kaylin. It's very nice to meet you. This is Kaylin of Funktronic Labs, one of the best game studio names I've heard thus far. And they made a really unique uh, turn-based in real-time title called uh, Nova 111. So I guess you'd be the best one to describe what it's about. Uh, Nova 111 is... It's a it's a turn based real time genre mashup. You uh, in the aftermath of a, a great science experiment, you you travel through these alien worlds and battle enemies and, and solve puzzles and rescue scientists who are stranded uh, throughout the worlds. So it's uh, it's kind of a, a quirky mix of lots of familiar but a fresh take on a lot of familiar game mechanics and. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty fun. So, what was the ins initial inspiration for this? Because I can easily imagine that when you start to say, okay, turn bla uh, turn based, turn based turn plus based. real time, the design for that can become wildly ambitious and outgrow scope. Yeah. So the the original uh, when Eddie and I were working at. At Q Games on the Pixel Junk series, we, we talked a lot about games that we'd like to make, and we uh, Eddie has an artist friend, Michael Hasinger, and uh, he, he did a couple of concepts that he just had some ideas for like this, this science theme, uh, visual style, I guess, and so we wanted to make a traditional roguelike out of it, and so we started doing prototypes of that, and it's, you know, randomly generated. Very, very like old school roguelike where you would, you know, put a crew together and take it to these randomly generated planets. And so that was uh, that was where I started. And we, we did some prototypes of that. And it was it was okay. It was some interesting gameplay and stuff. Uh, and then we wanted to really figure out how to make the procedurally generated levels a lot more interesting. So we we built a level editor so that we could, you know, build pieces and, and just sort of play it. And, and iterate and try out ideas and uh, it just turned out that the handmade levels were so much more, I don't know, unique and interesting uh, that we kind of just went all in on that style and, and, and built out the whole world. Wow. So a lot of it was a happy accident. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I don't think it's super uncommon in, in indie games, I guess. I think larger games, you know, you have to. There's so many pieces involved in making the, in, in development of the game that you kind of have to make a plan at the start, and it's it's hard to deviate from that. But for us, you know, it's just kind of being open to to interesting things that happen in development and just sort of rolling with it and chasing what's interesting. And so, like the real time, for example, the game was going to be just turn based, but we kind of just I don't know, sort of half accidentally, kind of on a whim, just tried doing a... had, had the latch enemy do damage in real time, and it, it just seemed like an interesting direction, so as we explored that more, uh, we found lots of interesting ways to use that, and it generated lots of interesting strategy and uh, gameplay mechanics, and so the, the story of the game kind of shifted more towards the you know, the turn-based time world and the, the real-time world being mixed up and you're kind of working to restore order between those two worlds. And it's strange, like, I can definitely see the be benefits in uh, this world not being procedurally generated. Yeah, when I, when I look over the levels, you know, I, I'm so interested in that field, just as a developer. Um, but when you look at the uniqueness of all the handmade levels, and it's the same for any game where the content is user generated, it's it's really really tough to to you know make those interesting memorable moments with random generation. Like if um, Super Mario Maker was a roguelike instead of a <laughs> game where you could um, make your own essentially. 
yeah, it's a lot of... It, you can generate a lot of interesting stuff, but it's all kind of the same in a way. Uh, so it's really hard to... Especially, you know, we wanted to have some light puzzle element. Uh, it's not a not really puzzle, it's more like just something to make you think a lot deeper about the way uh, lots of the game mechanics work together and how to use that to your advantage across term time and real time. And so procedurally generating, you know, uh, like like game stages that, that use those mechanics together is is really complicated. I, I don't know if, you know, it's even feasible to procedurally generate like puzzles of, of that quality, right? Yeah. Because you're throwing everything at me in this level. Like, <laughs> I was kind of rushing through, I'm like, oh, I'm understanding it, and suddenly, oh god, everything. So, speaking of, oh god, everything, like, how does it feel to be an indie, especially working on a title that's hard to immediately understand and express? This isn't exactly Goat Simulator, not that there's anything wrong with Goat Simulator, but it doesn't have that immediate um, track and pull, so is it overwhelming? Yeah. Is it scary? That's probably, I would say that's probably the, the hardest or weakest part of the game is that it's extremely difficult to convey. Uh, you, you can sort of convey the theme of the game quite easily, but I mean, having played it now, you understand what it's about, but you know, from the, the elevator pitch, it's, it's, hard to under, it's hard to really understand what, what is fun about playing the game. When you play through it, you, that feeling of sort of figuring out how things work and uh, sort of experimenting on the enemies to see how they behave in different situations and learning how all the things interact is it, it's it's a lot of fun to sort of figure that out over the course of multiple levels and you know as as all the new elements are introduced uh, yeah just that process of discovery and learning and mastery is is like very satisfying I think for people you know for gamers uh, absolutely but it, there's, you can't immediately just explain that it's like you can only really feel it as you play through the game and we when we took like a short demo of the game to show is people kind of understand the core gameplay but you know when you play it in a very like 10 minute short setting it's it's hard to hard to get that feeling as well so I think that's a challenge for game dev at the moment uh, something like goat simulator you, you look at you know one gif and you're like I know what that's about and you can see what's fun about it immediately uh, no, there's a challenge. It's like if you don't make something that's hard to immediately convey, it's going to be hard to hard to make people want to really sit down and play it. But I'm I'm happy because the people who do sit down and play it seem to really enjoy the experience, and so you know I'm glad that those people can enjoy it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh gosh, oh <laughs> these chargers are no joke. So. Yeah. How long have you been developing games? Um, I assume, especially with a lot of the thoughts you're expressing, that you've been doing this for quite some time now. Yeah, I guess, uh, I think about 12 years now. It's been a while. <laughs> um, I guess maybe maybe like 15 years in total. Um, wow. When I was like 15 or 16 or 17-ish, I started you know, dabbling in C++ programming and as soon as I got my, well actually as soon as I figured out that I could print text on the screen I started making a text based game and then once I figured out how to put a pixel on the screen I, I just started cloning old games, you know, Space Invaders and Pac-Man and you know, Asteroids, stuff like that and then just kept scaling that up to platformers and things and uh, I guess shortly after that I just started working on a, a large MMO team which was a huge change <laughs> You know, like a hundred person team. Uh, and I was on that for like four years in Australia. And then and then I moved to Japan, ended up getting a job at Key Games and worked on the Pixel Junk series. And, you know, that was going from like large scale studio to, uh, you know, a mid sized studio with multiple small teams. So I got to, I got to see a lot of, you know, different development practices and I guess, you know, a lot more indie and sort of. Lots more, lots of tighter, faster iteration on game design, and uh, lots more experimentation. And that was that was really good. 
So I was there for like seven years, and then, uh, and then me and Eddie, we started this studio, and we're in LA now, and I guess another year and a half from that. Oh gosh. <laughs> so you know the the latch and the like that moment there is you know one of the key things that I, I think the the game design managed to pull off is that. In chess, something like chess, we, we liken it to speed chess sometimes. It's like, you normally have time to think about what you're going to do in speed chess, uh, in, in normal chess, but under the pressure of time, it, it becomes a completely different game. And I, I think there's a little element of that. Something that, a situation that you, you're normally very comfortable in dealing with the strategy involved, when you have to do it fast, you know, you, you kind of elicit that panic response in your brain and your strategy kind of goes out the window and, and learning to <laughs> juggle those two things is it's like a, a kind of a new skill that it's, it's interesting to get used to. It definitely is. So what initially got you interested in video games? Like why not board games or card games or making endless clones of Jenga? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's no... no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just I never thought about it. I just never stopped playing them. You know, when I was from from long long ago on Commodore 64, you know, I just would just play games and I just never stopped. I never really stopped to think about it. I just never stopped playing games. <laughs> and eventually, that transitioned to making games. I know yeah. it's often discussed in independent development, but for younger people who want to get into gaming, what is the difference between developing a game and playing one? Development... The biggest difference, I guess, is that developing a game is, is hard and it takes a lot of time and dedication. <laughs> You know, playing a game is a, a way to relax, and development's like it's fun and it's it's uh, it's deeply, deeply satisfying. But it's you know, it's it's hard work. Uh, really, really getting a game to a like high level of polish and quality just takes a lot of time and hard work, and you really just have to stick to something for a long time. You know, I think playing a game it can be fun and you can play it for a long time, but you know, when you're bored of it, you, you just kind of you just go on to something else. But in the course of development, you know, sometimes there's sometimes there's downtimes where you have a lot of work to do that's not super exciting, but it just has to be done. And I guess I don't know. I guess that's different. Um, the the day day to day work, I guess for on the programming side, you know, the day to day work is just it's just sitting down and programming. You still have to keep the creative and sort of inspired part of your mind active if you if you want to like be mentally ready for the interesting ideas to come and, and put them into the game at the right time. But the bulk of it is just sitting down and programming. Ah, okay. Yeah, the more I get tools, the more possibilities there are every time I encounter an enemy or a group of enemies. Yeah. So when oh god I hate latches so much. Um <laughs> so can I take these abilities I've gained now and go back to earlier levels with them? Yeah, you can. So you, you'll be able to clear the levels a bit faster and easier. Um but I think generally people will just play it through sort of as is, but we I guess we saw no reason to stop you going back and playing again. So it's it's definitely possible. You'll be able to get a you know a better turn time and a better time time <laughs> if you want to do speed runs. So when we're doing the, you know, I, I really like speed runs. Watching a professional, but just watching like a great speed run is is kind of like a work of art. So I'm kind of excited that we could make a game that's kind of interesting to speed run. But given that it's turn-based as well, we, we tried to put in a, a turn speedrun where you try and complete the game in the lowest number of turns. And 
it's it's it was surprising how different the play style is because you know for for time based you just you just rush as fast as you can you know uh, avoiding enemies like doing whatever but for the for the turns you know sometimes you can really take your time and think about how you want to optimize your playthrough and sometimes you know sometimes it's good to take damage or and get knocked back by an enemy just so that you could save a turn or you know have an exploder like knock enemies out of the way so you don't have to spend a turn bumping them uh, I found that to be super interesting wow man so we're getting some interesting um, questions in the chat and we got someone we need to ban on the chat too I can't see the chat. Um, yeah, it's uh, twitch.tv slash games matter. And uh, one person said, turn speed run sounds cool. And they said, um, graphics look good, beautiful artwork, same looks on Vita? Yep, it's just uh, the same thing. Cool, cool deal. Um, Sorry, I'm in Twitch now. Hello, everybody. So, obviously, um, as you mentioned earlier, you did not make Nova 111 by yourself, just like Atlas with the weight of the world on his shoulders, and you're just making <laughs> the game. Uh, you actually have a partner, Eddie, uh, yeah. along with an amazing artist, etc. So, how did you get the team together? Um, because, you know, building, when you're building a team, especially if it's a small group, that's like one of the most important things you can do so how did that all come about and result in Nova 111? So for Eddie and I we we just started working together at Q Games and I don't know I guess we just got along and felt the same way about game development and uh, just kind of got excited together about things we wanted to make I guess when you get ex too excited about making something you just you just can't hold back, right? <laughs> so, so we just went off and started that. Uh, there was another guy who helped out with our prototype, doing level design. He's a really good level design and artist and programmer. He's kind of the magical Triforce guy. Uh, <laughs> and so he helped us put together some of the initial levels, and that was when we realized that the handmade levels are, you know, going to be much more interesting. Uh, so, you know, we knew him. We used to work with him as well, and uh, I think. Eddie knew the artist from Tig Source. He did a couple of small projects, just you know, mess about stuff while he was at university. And the sound guy, Eddie worked with him as well. And then, uh, yeah, we we just collaborated with some other people. We I guess met over the years. Another guy helped out with some you know game design experimentation stuff. Uh, a friend of mine who's in Canada now. And yeah, I don't know. I guess like over the years we just. You know, built up a, a set of people we knew that made really cool stuff, and I guess uh, we were excited enough about the game that they wanted to they wanted to join in and, and be a part of it. Awesome! So, not only did you build up kind of a roller <laughs> that's such an old reference a rolodex <laughs> of people after um, years of work and just associating, but. Having built up that A team, um, once you had an interesting vision, it was relatively easy to bring people on. Like, hey, we're making something cool. You want to join us at least in this capacity? Yeah, I think you know a lot of those people they do freelance stuff, so they're usually able to like clear their schedule and and join in, and that's not a big deal. Um, I guess I guess you know those other people I have met over the years that I would have loved to have worked with that you know they have a full time job at a company or something or uh, you know they're otherwise busy but um, I guess because we were happy with working remotely it opened up the possibility of working with a lot of people so Eddie and I were here but the the original other level designer he was in he was in Japan and the sound guys uh, somewhere else in America. My friends in Canada, another guy, another friend in uh, England helping out. So, I think I think working remotely gave us a chance to work with a lot of those people who, if if we had to all be in the same place, it wouldn't have been possible. Ah, okay. 
And actually, this isn't something I've been able to speak with someone about yet. What are the challenges of working remotely? Because, I mean, it seems like a, sounds like a dream solution, you know, work with talented people from around the world. <laughs> but, um, yeah, <laughs> what are the challenges I mean, that come with that? It's, it's tough. I would say it was one of the harder parts of this project, for sure. Uh, you know, like for, for England, uh, basically on the opposite time zone. So you kind of only have a very small overlap every day. So it kind of means like a one day cycle on anything. You're like, let's, let's change this level and let's uh, try a new thing. And then you put it in and then they try it the next day and then they give feedback and then you change it the next day. So it can take a long time to get, get things done. So instead of really focusing and like hammering on like one particular thing at a time, you kind of have to have a lot of those things running in parallel, which is just sort of hard to keep in your head at times. Uh, other than that, a lot of the interesting, a lot of the interesting ideas for a game come from just banter, you know. When you go out for lunch and you're just chatting about stuff, you're like, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if something?" You know, I don't know if you've seen the spinning armadillo enemy yet. Uh, I, um, I don't know if I have. No. Okay, he comes later, you know. I think he's he's one of the, you know he's a, a fun enemy, and. I mean, that was just Eddie and I chatting about some random stuff on a, on a walk to the coffee shop. And so... You don't, get, you don't really get that with remote development. Yeah, exactly. So you can meet up and, you know, these days you can Skype and you can be in chats. And you, you can talk a lot, but I think that kind of stuff makes a difference. So there's probably some lost potential for some interesting ideas that... Uh, I think my friend in Canada definitely always he has some great ideas and you know I'm sure we missed out on some cool stuff that he would have thought up if he was here just you know chatting around the proverbial water cooler <laughs> every day yeah but nevertheless the fact you it what it kind of made it worth it that you're able to work with those really cool people yeah so yeah, so maybe we missed out on a couple of like interesting ideas, but you know we got to we definitely got to work together and go through the ideas that they had and, and make some cool stuff. And I think it, I think it worked out well. It's just it's a it's a little bit more challenging, definitely, just keeping all that communication together. Um, I think I think Eddie and I we had to sort of maintain the the core of the game, so we just had to kind of make sure that. Everything, uh, everything came together at the end. So when you have everybody scattered around, they might be working on different parts of it. It's, I think you need like a core of the team to sort of bring it together into a cohesive whole. So it might be good, even if you're working remotely, to have at least a core of people in the same geographic location. Yeah, I think so. That's really good. I but haven't heard about that. Maybe. Man, I missed one secret. No. Uh -oh. So when you're thinking about like secrets and things to add to the game, when people think about stuff that they'd like to do in game development, they often think of the really cool stuff like um in Bloodborne, if you slide down a ladder wearing a pointy hat that's metal, it will actually bang on every rung of the ladder. And when people imagine game development, <laughs> they imagine that little stuff, not like database management issues or etc so yeah what were yeah, the, some of the, the oh you're saying oh the the bulk of the bulk of day-to-day -day stuff uh, maybe isn't quite that exciting I'm sure that was someone who had a cool idea over a lunch break or something and just slipped that in <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's where the that's where the flavor and like the, that's where you feel the passion from the developers you know you know, whoever did that is probably just, you know, he might work and he's like, okay, I've got to make 500 animations today, you know, for 500 weapons doing like the light attack. And he just sits down and does it and then he's working on a hat and he's like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, and that's sort of like that excitement and passion about the game, I think is, uh, I think that comes through in a, in a high quality game, you know, where you really feel that people are into the project and they, you know, really want to like add all those little touches that take it from good to great. And I guess, yeah, the hat feels like an example of that. Like that guy cared about what he was doing, you know?
Yeah. He wasn't just making the ladder animation. So, what? So, what role did you serve on the team? Um, Eddie and I are both programmers, so I guess uh, I guess I lean more on the gameplay and systems code, and uh, I guess Eddie leans more on the graphics programming and system code. So we have a lot of overlap, and but yeah, I guess I would wait more on the, the gameplay code and the game design. And, like making all the enemies and stuff, and I would make like a rough version of them, that have the mechanics, and uh, Eddie will make them look really nice and make them feel good and make them move nicely and just sort of like really bring the quality bar up. So, oh, okay. So I, I tend to like prototype a lot of stuff. So you know, there's uh, I don't know maybe like 50 enemies that aren't in the game that we tried and got to some you know level of interesting gameplay, but it just it just wasn't good enough. Do you think that? Oh man, I, that little uh, that dude can turn the cannons fire back on them. That's oh yeah, that's one of the. There's also like small interactions like that. That I mean, it, it takes a while for you to notice them all, but yeah, I think it, it feels good when you start to understand and master all of those little details. Oh gosh. So when you're dealing with building systems and gameplay that mashes turn-based and real-time elements, what are some of the bugs you encountered? Like, I just can't imagine just the horrific um, bugs you must have seen at some at certain points. Yeah, it was that was a lot of complicated bugs. So everything, you know, the the turn system has to be very strict about how it how it actually runs even though everything looks like it's like when, when you when you start moving and all the all everything moves smoothly you know you can see these bullets now like when you take a turn they slide and you slide and the enemies slide um, and it's all like very fluid like when the turns are happening but you know everything has to be like strictly on one grid point at any time it, it can't it can't exist in between the grid or the rules of the game kind of break down so making all of that mesh together well was really complicated. So you know, just as a simple case, like when two enemies try to move onto the same square, like what's what's supposed to happen? You know, <laughs> are they supposed to go simultaneously? Um, if you have if you have one enemy that you know just because of his aesthetic, he he rolls fast. Does he get there before the other guy, or you know, do they do they? in the, the turn time that they both try and move there immediately. Uh, like balancing all of that stuff uh, led to a lot of tricky bugs. Um, the other thing is that for... After the player moves, the player takes his turn and then all of the enemies take their turn. So if, if you want to wait for all of the enemies to finish their turn, you can imagine that the player slides and finishes, and then the enemies start, and they all slide and finish. And you can imagine that, like, even though it's you know, like half a second at a time, if you're trying to like move around really fast, that would, it would be very laggy. It would be like a every time you move one square, you have to stop and wait for all the enemies to do their little move. <clears throat> so we, we do kind of a trick where you actually, like, internally you teleport to the next grid tile and then the, the visuals of the enemies just slide for the rest of the time and so you're, you're kind of hopping the tiles immediately behind the scenes and so we have the, the visuals of it looking a lot smoother than the actual grid movement and while that made it the input feel a lot nicer and you can feel like you can zip around even though you know technically the turns have to be in a very strict order uh, it led to lots of bugs where you know if you're trying to like this spinning enemy when he knocks you back but you've, you're halfway through a move to another tile like where, where should you get knocked back to? Yeah, there's, there's lots of strange bugs. <laughs> Can you give us an example? Um, if a armadillo that the rolling enemy you just encountered when, they, when an armadillo rolled into a rolling armadillo and knocked it back and that armadillo was killed by a laser at the same time, the first armadillo would would kind of hang waiting for the other armadillo to finish his move so that he could knock him back. And you know, finding those bugs was 
was really complicated. Yeah, how did, how did you even <laughs> find that? It, just playing the game a lot. But that, I mean, that's one example of... Actually, that, that, that bug was in a live build, briefly. <laughs> um, but there was, a, there was a ton of bugs like that that are just really, really strange edge cases. And I don't know, you just play the game a lot and just, just run into them by sheer luck. And then you're like, how did that happen? And you dig through the code and it's a just a very strange, complicated, you know, order of things happening together. Speaking of a little bit strange, um, No. 111 has really interesting, quite funny in my opinion, writing. So, <laughs> when you're making a game that's ostensibly puzzle-based, why include those um, humorous elements, for example? So the... So at the start of the project, while we uh, when we had our office in Kyoto, it was me, Eddie, um, and the other level designer, and he was a British guy, and he just had kind of a quirky sense of humor. And I don't know, we didn't we didn't really plan it. He, we just kind of added it on a we added the speech bubble so that we could uh, have the the scientists say things when you rescued them, and then we just kind of on a whim added them saying some funny dialogue and. I don't know, I guess he just had an interesting sense of humor that, that kind of fit the tone of the game. And so and so we just we just went with that. And then uh, we got a, another friend to help out with writing and he, he's a game dev and he kind of has a great sense of humor and he was British as well and yeah, he just he just wrote lots of really funny stuff. And I don't know, I think for people who are who are into that stuff, they, they get a lot of value out of it and enjoy reading it. And people who aren't like it just doesn't really, you know, they just don't really pay attention. But if you're if you're into like wordplay and and that kind of British humor, uh, yeah, I think, I think you enjoy it a lot. So Nova One Eleven is basically gaming's Monty Python. We can say that. Can we put that in the box? Yeah, yeah. Let's put that <laughs> on the headline. <laughs> oh gosh. So oh, when, when you were trying to find a certain. <laughs> This is too much for me. I'm not cut out for this. Doctor Science. It's actually, it's, it's really hard to play the game and talk. That's something I I've learned doing a lot of like live playthroughs while you know interviewing or talking with people. It's it's really hard to juggle. Oh man, yeah, I I can definitely understand why. So, let's phase through here. You said that you prototyped a bunch of different enemy designs, but not, but there were some that they just weren't good enough. They just didn't fit your vision of the game, or they just didn't hit the certain bar of quality. So, what determined that for you? Like, what was good enough, and what was some? Of, what are some of the enemies that never came to really be? I guess like the driving force for deciding whether something should stay or not stay for this game was. Um, was it different enough from the other enemies is like one thing uh, was there a thematically interesting way to make it fit the world and the other one was uh, it, it had to have there had to be multiple layers of sort of gaining mastery over the enemy so the armadillo you know he, he rolls in two squares you know he went through a lot of iterations and there's a there's a couple of versions that have different behavior um, some that are you know, the final one, he's invincible when he's rolling or when he's spinning up the charge and he rolls two squares. But changing, you know, the original one rolled all the way across the room and he did a knockback. Uh, but that kind of overlapped with the dasher a lot in terms of behavior. And so it, it was more like you had already learned the dasher. And so it, it wasn't an interesting or new enough set of things to learn about the behavior. So we, we tried to change it a little bit. And so he does a, a roll and a knockback instead of just a full roll. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's, is, the, is it a new kind of enemy that takes a new way of thinking to sort of master its behavior? Interesting, interesting. Speaking of enemy, um, that blue arm, it's a blue armadillo that spins. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Am I basically killing Sonic? Yeah. 
<laughs> Did he deserve so, uh, it? The placeholder graphics were actually Sonic when we were doing the testing. Um, but you know, we, the, the artist is really great. We kind of just would give him the, the way the enemy would explain how the enemy worked and he would just come up with this you know great graphic in this style of the world that all came from his mind and that was really great so yeah we could say it, it spins like Sonic and you know he just and it's invincible sometimes and he just kind of knew how to make it look cool and be different so that was, that was really good to work with him for that. Sonic has been dead for a while now one person said. It's because you keep killing him. <laughs> <laughs> this is messier than that day at Pippin's Safari Park. What is your favorite type of enemy? Oh... I like... Oh, that was tough. I actually like the armadillo. Uh, because you can use it against other enemies in an interesting way. And that it has a, it has a lot of rhythm of battle. Um, the two squares, like, you know, it sounds like something really simple, like one square versus two squares are rolling, but it changes a lot how you can maneuver around the game space. And you can actually, like, redirect it with the laser, the, the beam weapon, which means you can you can use it against the other enemies. And so I just like that there's a lot of little tricks that you can learn about the enemy. And uh, just sort of the timing and rhythm of killing the enemy in the least number of turns, it, it takes you a while and, you know, the, the basic enemy, you just bump it twice, right? So there's not really much to really dig down and, and figure out how to beat it quickly. But I've, I like the enemies where once you've mastered the, the turn sequences and behavior a lot, you can, you can kill them really easily, but it, it took you a lot of work and thinking to understand how to get to that point. Like the, the things that are shooting the the projectile balls, the plasma guys. You know, now it's like you can bump them and then dodge out of the way while they shoot and then move up and bump them again and then dodge out of the way. You know, it's like this three turn, three cycle to kill them. And it just feels like, you know, it feels kind of like slow and tedious sometimes when you want to really kill it. But once you start to understand some of the other mechanics, you realize that you can take a step back it's like you can bump it, take a step back, and then laser, and its shot will rebound into itself, and the laser hits it, and you, you kill it in like two turns. And so, that's just like one example of gaining mastery over how an enemy works, and let you, you know, really defeat things a lot easier and quicker. Wow, I'm, I'm finding a lot of Mr. George's. Whoa, who oh, yeah. is this dude? <laughs> that's kind of a last minute uh, Easter egg. <laughs> Interesting. He, so he's... he just he just gives you uh, silly advice. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, am I gonna have to? Is the final boss like Mr. George? He was like, I was the villain all along. <laughs> no, no, but I, I think the final boss is really exciting. I do not want to spoil it. So, how do you make a final boss for a game like this? Or, like, when you think in traditional uh, game structure, how do you even? Yeah, how do you adapt traditional game concepts to something that really doesn't fit a something that's been done thus far? Yeah, I guess, so we have three worlds, you know, and the, the first world, the theme of it is about the basic rules of the game and combat. Uh, the second world is, a, is about thinking a lot more and using uh, sort of switches and doors mixed in with that combat, so it's it's kind of a lot more strategic and and there's there's more puzzle solving on top of the combat and then the third world is uh, I guess you haven't got the time stop ability yet but you know you can freeze time and push enemies around so it's kind of like you freeze time and rearrange a chessboard how you like it. It's like that scene in uh, X-Men Days of Future Past essentially. <laughs> oh I haven't seen that. Oh, okay I won't spoil it for you. <laughs> oh. Yeah so you know, the third world is supposed to be all about the the times being all mixed up. So we try to think like, what's a boss that embodies that a lot? And so just based on the theme of this world, we the the first world boss is very combat focused, and it's it's one of the basic enemies, but it's it's very large, uh, and it's like two by two squares. You know, so it changes the combat dynamic a lot, and that's just a a basic fight. 
so but challenging fight. And then the second one, it's like, how can we take the, it's like, how can we take the concepts that you sort of learned and mastered throughout that world and sort of make the boss like a final test of those concepts? And so the the second boss is, it's kind of like solving a puzzle to defeat him. Um, you sort of have to figure out how to like turn, like shut down all of these things so that you can damage the boss. And you know, on top of like all, all the the turn-based and real-time fighting going on. And then because the third world is very much about just sort of time and breaking the rules of the, the universe that you've gotten used to at that point, we just kind of wanted to get a little bit crazy. And so uh, that boss has a bunch of phases that I guess each way that he acts is kind of like a, a new way of behaving that you have to like figure out and understand. And it's like... It's like a whole bunch of new stuff, so it's kind of like taking the fundamental skills that you've learned about the rules of the game, and then... Breaking every uh, single one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but still keeping it kind of intuitive in a way that you can figure out how it's working. It's... Yeah. It's kind of hard to explain. I, I guess you'll, you'll see when you get to it, but... Yeah, we wanted to... I guess the theme was take the take the rules, take the things that you've learned over the course of that world, and like make the boss like a final test of that. So yeah, Nova 111 is actually out now. Someone can feasibly get it on their uh, PlayStation console or Xbox console or PC, and stuff it in their face and just oh, yeah, yeah. play it through it. How does it feel to have a game that? you and your partners made and it's just there and it's on consoles I know it's it's hard to believe you know you just work on it like every day for so long and then it's and then one day there's nothing left to do <laughs> it's, it's kind of a strange feeling but it's it's good it's good you know everybody who plays it seems to enjoy it so I, I'm just happy that you know we, we wanted to take the challenge of we wanted to take the challenge of Making something that was new, that had some game mechanics that hadn't really been explored. And I don't know. I feel like I feel like we kind of pulled that off. There's things I'd love to improve about the game, but you know, I think we've reached the goal of putting something new into the world. And I guess it just feels good, and I just wish it. I just hope no, that you like, know lots of people can like enjoy that. That off. There's things I'd love have to some freshness in their gaming life. <laughs> So, do you see a lot of freshness, especially coming out of the indie space? Yeah, there's there's tons of interesting stuff in indie games. Um, I mean, there's also a ton of clones, and you know, sometimes it it can be a little saddening that the things that are really popular and you know really dominate like Steam and the gaming industry overall can be kind of the same thing over and over again. But you know, oh my lord! Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I just found that's you know, just how it is. I just found the, On the boss. Um, is she angry because we smushed all her babies? Yeah. <laughs> God, how did I kill you? Oh. She just killed her own babies. They're messy. <laughs> So, I, I remember when I was like looking at ideas for how to do the bosses, I remember sitting down and watching a giant compilation of every single Mega Man, uh, every single Mega Man boss ever made. That was a uh, lot of inspiration. Those bosses are really well made. They're so simple, but well made. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, this is just really scary. Uh, you actually spoke about um, inf influences and really interesting things being in the game development space. Like, and that's actually a common thing I've heard. Like, there is a lot of really amazing things being done, but game developers don't really get a chance to do it much because they're so busy making games that they can't play them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hot. I mean, there's more games than I could possibly play. You know, the set of games that I want to play, 
that I really, really on my like must play, like must experience list is you know too long to ever get through, which is which is kind of sad, you know, but it's just how it is. So how do you deal with that? Like, do you make a, a time to kind of research games, or does that come in between projects? Um, I mean, I try to play a little bit of games every day. You know, and I still love to play games. It's just that you don't have as much time compared to when you're a kid. <laughs> you can play it all day. Or, uh, yeah, I, I still just, I just play as many as I can. You know, that's that's the best you can do. But uh, I would say compared to, I would say that there's a lot of games that I I play for a shorter time now. And I think they deserve, but because I just really want to experience a lot more games. Whereas maybe when I was younger, I would stick with the same game for a much longer time. Um, but you know, now now I just I really want to see all the the new experiences that people are building. And I guess that just means that I I trade off going deeper into some games than I would like to. So you almost appreciate games as an art now, rather than a simple entertainment experience. Um, I guess this, I don't know, I guess it's both for me. Get away from me, foe creature, no! <laughs> Sorry, I'm just watching you, oh god. You haven't even done any damage to him. <laughs> uh oh. I got pinned in the corner. Bombs to nothing. So you actually had a publisher for Nova 111, Curve Digital, uh, the same people who published yeah. stuff like The Swapper, uh, Thomas Was Alone, that's a pretty great stable to come from. Yeah, they're super cool guys, so we we took our demo to PAX, uh, the year we got into, uh, we took it to GDC, and uh, the year we, we showed it PAX 10 and the Indie Mega Boot and some stuff at GDC, and yeah, we just kind of randomly ran into those guys and they played the demo and they they just kind of like got the, the style of the game and they were super into it. So, um, you know, they wanted to put it on consoles and like for a small group like us, I mean, I've gone through the experience of porting a game to console and it, it's a lot of it's a lot of time and and effort that, you know, we could, we could spend making a new game, you know, there's so many things we want to make that um, we, just, we just felt it was better to, to work with those guys and they would, they would handle the porting to console and, and we could just focus on the game itself and yeah, that, that just worked out great, so now it's on the consoles. So what has the reaction in Nova 111 been thus far? Um, it's been quiet but positive. So, definitely want to get the game out there a bit more. Um, but everyone who's played it seems to enjoy it. So, I uh, just just want to have more people play it, basically. Okay, I'm in reasonably good shape. <laughs> uh. Okay, I take back everything I said about being in good shape. Gosh dang it! Dang boss! Yeah! So Nova 111. For the, for Ag, Ag Bavna, um, actually the, one of the level designers uh, from Curve helped out getting the, for the second, second and third world. Um, he, he did a lot of levels for, um, for stealth, stealth Inc. So, if you like that, I think you'll, you'll definitely like those stages. Actually, so, what is your favorite world? After looking back upon the development of the game. Ooh, it's tough. I would have to say World 2. The puzzly one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still, there's, there's puzzles in it. It's still got a lot of game going on, but... Um, I think just the sheer number of like elements interacting, I, I find very exciting, and it's where it's where the real time stuff really starts to come into all of the all of the gameplay. You know, there's like real time lasers and stuff.
Okay. Um, I also like some of the World 3 stuff when it gets into it. There's some stuff that like flips on black and white. Uh, like different phases of existence, things that are like, I don't know. An inverse world that doesn't exist, and the time spaces are inverted. That, that gets kind of crazy and interesting. <laughs> it's kind of like mind bending. You know, you're, you're trying to deal with this like arcade style combat like this uh, in the middle of things phasing in and out of existence and things happening in real time. And, um, it's just it's just a lot of interesting stuff happening. Considering nice how too. little he contributed to, during the fight, I don't think he deserves to get to name her Chomp Queen. Just my personal opinion. <laughs> He was watching it over you. <laughs> he was he was behind me, way behind me. <laughs> so yeah, that's the first world of Nova 111 complete. Um, that was super fun. I got an F rank, but uh. Oh yeah, the the ranks. So the ranks are based on the damage you take. It's kind of not very clear. I think uh, if we threw some more time at development, we'd probably clean that up a bit, make it a bit easier to understand. Speaking of, what's next for you and uh, Nova 111? Um, virtual reality is, is what we're going to spend our time on right now, so super excited about that. You know, it's a completely new field and no one knows what it's going to be like and games in virtual reality are going to be, you know, like Doom and, and Mario, like, define these entire genres and you know, those, those kind of genre-defining games are just yet to be discovered in that space. So, super excited for that. Um, and then for Nova, I don't know. I mean, if if, uh, if, it, if it, you know, keeps going well on Steam, uh, we'll, we'll put some more time into adding some features. I think, uh, I think I'd like to spend some time on, like, procedurally generated levels and uh, clean up the level editor and Steamworks support. At what point can you decide that a game is really like you love it, but you can't really do much to add to it at a certain point? At which point do you realize that it's not really profitable anymore? Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if I guess it's more like what it just feels like there's demand for. You know, if, if people really, really, really want more stuff, then... Uh, I guess we'll, we'll go and add it, right? But we, it, it's kind of a traditional game in that it's it's just like this is the game experience, and try to make it like a complete whole, so that you know you just you clear the game and you, you feel like you just you know like the way you watch a movie, right? You, yeah. You just like it's like an experience, and then you're kind of satisfied. Um, you know, we would like to explore ways to add more value for people who want to just get some more out of it. This entire world is very different from the previous one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the three worlds are, are pretty different. Yeah, you know, each each level adds you know, one or two extra elements, and so the number of combinations of things that work together just goes up and up and up. And so... It's, it's really interesting. What's next for you is just, yeah, keep on trucking and you're moving into VR, which is a really interesting and um, very exciting space. Um, where can people follow yeah. you and your work and future developments? Uh, you can follow us at Funtronic Labs. You can follow me at... Funktronic Labs on Twitter and etc. And you are... I messed up my Twitter, but you can see that. Um, let's show the links in for... Callan, uh, Kalen, yeah. underscore T, and Eddie, at Eddie Tree. Yeah. You, can, you can follow us, and, you know, as soon as we're working on stuff, uh, we always post, like, in development the screenshots, and... Because Eddie does lots of graphical stuff, he's always chasing out. Lots of really amazing looking stuff, so definitely, definitely keep an eye on that. It's cool stuff. Uh, any final words? Any advice to people who want to get into gaming? We want to get into gaming. 
make games. Just keep making games. Start small. You know, clone, clone old games. Uh, learn. I guess these days I would say learn Unity, learn C++. Uh, you know, learn to make art, and and just keep making them. You know, make a small game, finish it. Actually, yeah, learn learn to finish games is probably more valuable. So, just pick a small game and finish it, and then do another one, and do another one, and do another one, and even after if a certain amount of that, even if just, it looks like crap or whatever, just you know, finish it. Just, yeah, have a have a vision and 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 do it as a whole, as a whole. I don't want to say product, you know, as a whole thing. And then uh, just keep doing that, and then in a couple of years you'll just be a game developer. <laughs> it's, it's kind of all there is to it. <clears throat> it's the finishing of a project, not so much the initial making of it, that determines a game or game developer. Yeah, I think that's what I find separates. Um, I don't know, just like if you if you really want to get into industry as a professional, like that's kind of a a defining trait of what I what I feel is like a professional game developer is, you know, they can get to the end. Um, you know, you, it's fun to like jam on interesting ideas, but you know, if you want to make it like a real solid game, you just have to you have to get all the way through and really like be tenacious and stick to something and so I think it's a it's a good trait to work work on. This has been Nova 111 Worlds 1 and 2. It's kicked my butt. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and this is Funktronic Labs. If you can support them, please do. It's on, the game is on PC, uh, PlayStation platforms, I think um, Wii U and 3DS now. Yep. Wii U and 3DS, and Xbox uh, stuff. I think it's Xbox One in particular, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think we have it on 360. Yep. Yeah. So, please support them if you can, and otherwise, there will be a small giveaway on Twitter, at GamesMatterHQ, just after this ends. Many thanks to Kalen for forgiving me for butchering his name and for showing off their <laughs> wonderful game. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, and yeah, many thanks, thanks to uh, all of you for, for watching and supporting. And I just covered up your words completely. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yep. Until yeah, yeah. Thanks for watching, everyone. Until next time. Bye.